was the Sound of the Wasp off of the ITEA Legacy series. If you happen to have that CD, that was released about 20 years ago. Uh, and that was Rich Madison playing. My name is Ken Drovnik. I am currently the ITEA historian. I also teach at Texas A&M University at Commerce. And I'm going to talk about ITEA history to reshape the image. In this presentation, we're going to talk primarily about the early years, 1966 to 1986. And we'll see how the goals and objectives of the organization and the professionals that founded it led to what we have today. Workshops, music, uh, libraries. You may recognize two of the three individuals on the screen. Of course, R. Winston Morris in the middle and then Harvey Phillips on the right. Now, Harvey and Winston are two who were the most responsible for getting the official TUBA founded in 1973, and also Leslie Varner, who we will talk about in a couple of slides. The person on the left, you may not be quite as familiar with, that is Robert Riker, and he founded a TUBA, I'll call it the precursor TUBA, in 1966, when he was performing with the Montreal uh, Symphony in Canada. He had an assistant, his assistant's name was Mr. Trigg, and the two of them together sent out newsletters and registration forms and recruited active professional tubists to be in TUBA. Now, the idea was not originally Mr. Rikers. Many of you probably already know who came up with the idea for an association for tuba and euphonium players. That was Bill Bell. He was the one who kept saying, someone should start an association for tuba players. And Bell came up with that idea way back in the 1930s. But it was H. Robert Riker in the 1960s, in 1966. Uh, he started what became the Precursor Organization. Uh, and you may not recognize that picture of Bill Bell, or maybe you haven't seen it. That comes from the archives of Fred Marsden. Now, Fred was a tuba artist and an instrument designer. There are still Marzan tubas and Marzan euphoniums out there in the field. The photo next to Mr. Bell is Jim Self. Now, when this picture was taken in the mid-1970s, Jim was teaching in Tennessee. Of course, now we know Jim more as a recording artist and professional player in the Los Angeles, California area. Photo in the middle, that is Constance Walden. Now, she taught at the University of Miami, and she had a phenomenal young student by the name of Sam Palafian. And that name you probably all recognize. Now, Constance ran a composition contest for tuba at the University of Miami. And one of the things that they would talk about at the meetings that this TUBA had was some of the music that was composed at uh, this contest at the University of Miami. And then Constance would bring her ensemble to Midwest and they would play some of this music. And that is one of the forerunners of the current tuba ensemble. But she was involved in this early TUBA. The person next to uh, Ms. Walden is Alexei Lebedev. He was a Russian tubist, and he was also a composer. Many of you may recognize uh, his name from the Lebedev Concerto in One Movement for Tuba and Piano, or the Lebedev Concerto uh, Concert Allegro, I believe. Uh, next to Lebedev, is Ray Draper. Now, Ray Draper was a jazz artist who played with John Coltrane on some of uh, John Coltrane's early uh, jazz records. In the second row, there's some faces that are probably familiar, one being Arnold Jacobs on the lower left, and I believe that picture was taken at Southern Methodist University during one of his master classes. Uh, I don't know the year on that. Next to him is Abe Torchinsky. He played the Philadelphia Orchestra for many years and then taught at the University of Michigan. The photo of the gentleman next to Mr. Torchinsky, that is Philip Catalané. Of course, Catalané premiered the Ray Fon Williams Tuba Concerto in 1954. Now, those three artists were all excited to have a tuba organization, but Jacobs and Torchinsky especially, busy performing careers, didn't didn't really contribute in the early years to uh, Riker's organization. Cal and A wrote a nice letter. Man, this is great. I'm fully enthusiastic of this idea. 
Uh, now, this picture of Kendall and A, that is from the UT Austin Conference, and I believe that was 1986. And the picture next to Mr. Kendall and A, that is Don Harry. Many of you know Don, who has taught at the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York, for many years. And right before the pandemic, stepped down from playing with the Buffalo Philharmonic. Now, Riker's assistant was Will Trigg. And I don't have a picture of Mr. Trigg, but he is the one who did a lot of the correspondence and the copying and a lot of the secretarial work. And what Riker and what Trigg found was that this was too much work for one or two people. So what happened, R. Winston Morrison and Harvey stepped into the picture. And at these meetings at Midwest, they talked about, we need a constitution for Tuvist Universal Brotherhood Association. One reason is that they needed to be established as a non-profit entity. When you have money exchanging hands, this brings tax implications in any country, or maybe I should say in every country. Now, there's a picture of Leslie Varner, who is also um, one of the three who helped establish TUBA. And Leslie, Harvey, and Winston met at Ball State University. Ball State University is located in Muncie, Indiana, if you're not familiar with where that is. Uh, Muncie is in the northeast corner of Indiana. It's perhaps an hour south of the Michigan state line. Uh, and maybe an hour west of the Ohio uh, state line, if you're familiar with that area of the United States. In addition to establishing a constitution, they came up with these goals and objectives. To expand performance and job opportunities. To redefine the image and role of our instruments and the performer. To explore pedagogical approaches through new teaching materials. To, pr to promote activity and new instrument design, to generate new compositions for the tuba and euphonium, to explore new directions and technique, to establish appropriate libraries of recorded and printed materials, to coordinate and co-sponsor tuba euphonium symposium workshops, to publish a TUBA newsletter to be distributed to all members. In 1973, organization was established. If you look in the early Tuba newsletters, you're going to see that there was an international president by the name of Robert Eliason. Now, these two pictures of Dr. Eliason are from when he served as curator of musical instruments at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. Dearborn is a suburb of Detroit, somewhat close to Ann Arbor, Michigan. And then Harvey was the first president, and then uh, Dan Parentoni followed uh, Harvey as the as president. In the early newsletters it will say North American president. Harvey's concept was that TUBA was the North American chapter of the Tubist Universal Brotherhood Association and down the road there would be a European chapter and then there would be a South American chapter and so on. And these would come under the International Brass Congress. Now that's not quite how things worked out. Uh, we are still our own separate entity and we do things with the International Brass Congress. Uh, and many of our members are also members of, of IBC. If you are interested in uh, some of the nitty gritty of the happenings of the meetings in 1971-1972 that established TUBA, Michael Lynch, who was the previous historian, wrote two articles for the journal the inception of TUBA in the fall 2012 issue, and then the early growth of TUBA in the winter 2013 issue. In 1977, Carter Lika wrote a history of the TUBA as part of a master's paper. And that is floating around online, and that has uh, interesting notes about what they were doing in the first five years. The center picture is the first logo of TUBA, and you'll see that that is a serpent with the initials TUBA across uh, the instrument. What about the euphonium? Riker conceived his organization as being for professional tubists. But guess what? 
many more players were interested in being in that group. College students, high school students, band directors who play tuba and euphonium on the side, they all wanted to be involved. So, how did we get to euphonium? R. Winston Morris and Harvey Phillips wanted the euphonium involved with TUBA from the beginning. They thought of it as the tenor tuba of the tuba family. Now, these three gentlemen that you see on your screen, on the left, you probably recognize Brian Bowen. On the right is Ray Young, and he was the first euphonium coordinator of TUBA. R. Winston Morris contacted Ray, said, would you do this? And he said, yes. But was there an alternative? There was. In the center of your screen is a picture of Fred Dart, who was a euphonium artist in the 1960s, and he played with the United States Air Force Band. And then he went into band conducting, and he taught at The Ohio State University, the University of Kentucky, and the University of New Mexico. And later he retired to Idaho. He proposed starting an association for euphonium players. Now, I just recently uncovered a memo that talks about this, and I'm working on a journal article about that organization, and that'll be out later this year. So who is most involved with getting the euphonium into TUBA? Brian Bowman. Brian contacted his colleagues in the military bands in Washington, D.C., and got them involved with TUBA. He also reached out to recent retirees and the big names in the 1970s, Leonard Falcone, Harold Brosh, Arthur Lehman, said, will you sign on to helping get euphoniums to, to join TUBA? And they did. Also in Japan, Toru Miro encouraged his students to join TUBA. In the beginning, in 1973 and 1974, only 5, maybe 10% of the membership were euphonium players. Of course, that's not true today, and that can be largely credited to the work that Brian Bowman did. What about the name change to ITEA? That was first proposed in 1979. I found a member by Stephen Bryant, who at the time taught at the University of Texas at Austin, and Don Little, who taught at North Texas State, and they proposed changing the name to International Tuba Euphonium Association, and that memo circulated to the board members. R. Winston Morris also wrote a memo suggesting maybe we should call it the International Euphonium Tuba Association. Now, the board cannot just change the name of the organization. That requires a vote of the membership. So that did take many years to complete, but we are known and have been since that official change was done as the International Tuba Euphonium Association. As I mentioned earlier, one of the big objectives or goals of the original organization was to have conferences or symposiums where new music could be performed, artists could perform, and the community could get together and work to improve everything for tuba and euphonium. In the center of the screen, that is the front cover of the brochure for the first International Tuba Symposium Workshop. That is Bill Bell, and that is probably the picture from 1921 when he was playing with the Sousa Band. Uh, that picture with him in a rain catcher, that is around. You can find that picture on, on Google with a simple search as well. Some of the artists who were at the conference, Howard Johnson who's pictured in the top right corner. Rich Madison and Jim Self, who are in the lower left corner. Arnold Jacobs did a clinic on breathing. And Harvey and R. Winston Morris were there, of course. Also, Brian Bowman and Earl Lauder. Now, Earl was the second euphonium coordinator, or TUBA. I have this great picture of Brian and Earl at the 73 conference, and I'm hoping to get that printed in the journal soon. So who would come to a tuba conference? Well, there's a picture of all the attendees at the first conference in 1973. If you look around on Facebook, there was an attempt to name everyone in the photo. And, you know, that would be kind of tough, but that would be uh, fun to do. 
and you can see there's a schedule of events I do have the schedule and I am working on a column where we'll reprint the program and we'll talk a little bit about the sessions that were at the first conference and I'll publish pictures that I have now I don't have too many pictures from 1973 of course cell phones were not in everyone's pocket so if you happen to have a picture from 1973 find me please do a search for my name on the internet and uh, I'll come up today we're used to having an international workshop and then in the subsequent year we would have a regional workshop in the mid 1970s there were international workshops and national workshops and you can see the first two on your screen Dan Parentoni, Mr. P, hosted the first at the University of Illinois, and, and that's a great caricature of Mr. P. The second was hosted by David Keene and Don Little at what was then North Texas State University. Other conferences are held all over the world. TUBA or ITEA has hosted conferences in Italy and Austria. There are other national organizations that host their own conferences in Brazil or Spain, for example that are usually affiliated with ITEA. The United States Army Band 2B Phoneme Conference has been going uh, since at least 1984, and I believe this is the first year. Uh, if not, this is one of the first programs. For many years, that conference was a TUBA regional conference. Now, sometimes it is a regional conference, sometimes it's just its own conference. Another one of the goals of TUBA was to establish a library of music. This would be a library of published music available through interlibrary loan to the membership. The TUBA Resource Library was established at Ball State University uh, in 1976. And the letter you see on the screen is from the president to R. Winston Morris, thanking him for establishing the library at Ball State. It's still there the music is still available. If you're looking for what is out of print today, it may be at Ball State and you can visit your local library and see if you are able to, to request those materials through interlibrary loan. At the time, Leslie Varner was the instructor of tuba at Ball State. Uh, and then when he stepped down, uh, Jeffrey Rideout became the next professor of tuba and euphonium. And he then was the contact for the TUBA Resource Library. Ball State is in Muncie, Indiana. It's about an hour uh, from the Michigan line and an hour from the Ohio line uh, in the northeast corner of Indiana, if you're familiar with that region of the country. One of the big goals and objectives was repertoire. As far as I can tell, the first distribution service of new music was from Tennessee Technological University through the School of Music and through R. Winston Morris. He had a manuscripts for tuba service and on the left side of your screen you can see some of this music posted tuba and piano two part three part. It's about a seven page catalog that I have found in the archives and it was basically a mail order service if you wanted piece of music. The cost was enough to cover postage and copying costs uh, and a little bit for the Department of Music. When TUBA was formed in 1973, the first attempt of promoting music, or one of the first attempts, was a subscription service that the organization conducted. And the idea was that for a $10 yearly fee, you would receive two or three new pieces of music. Now, this service was meant to be selective, so composers would submit their pieces, and two or three would be chosen. What happens to the other 22 or 23? So, after the subscription service didn't have as much interest as originally anticipated, TUBA established an unpublished manuscript service at the University of Kansas. If you go back in the journals, it will say TUBA Resource Library of Unpublished Music. 
which is a little different than the TUBA resource library of published music that was at Ball State. So it's a little bit of a confusing name, but it was the same concept that they had initially in 1973. If there was a piece of unpublished music, you would send in a fee to uh, Scott, Watson, Scott Watson at the University of Kansas or to the library, and then your music would come in six to eight weeks or however, the, however long the turnaround was. This didn't promote a lot of new music. It promoted some new music. When the board changed the setup to TUBA Press around 1990 and started to pay composers royalties for each sale on their works of 20%, which was pretty high at that time, interest took off, new music took off. David Miles ran TUBA from 19, I think it was 1991 to 2008. And in the journal that is going to hit your mailbox in early June or be posted to the website in early June, there's an article on the history of the press uh, in the Looking Back column. And it's, it's very interesting. When TUBA changed its name to ITEA, the name of the press was changed to 2 B Euphonium Press. Now today, 2 B Euphonium Press is part of Chimron. And you can go to Chimron Music's website. And Brian Dowdy, who is doing a fantastic job uh, running Chimron Press, there is a tab of all titles published by Tuba Euphonia Press or TUBA Press uh, beforehand. And you just click on that and everything pops up. And it's all searchable and everything should still be available today. The last item I want to mention in the same year that TUBA was founded, the Instrumentalist magazine declared 1973 the year of the tuba. If you have access to the February 1973 issue, that is the tuba issue, where Harvey and other artists talk about TUBA and the importance of tuba and euphonium and the need for music for tuba and euphonium and low brass ensembles. Along with improving the image of our instruments, Harvey conducted a series of recitals in Carnegie Hall. And this is part of uh, one of the programs. And you can see that Alec Wilder is the first composer listed on this particular program who was a close friend of Harvey and wrote tons of music for Harvey to play. And a subsequent looking back column will have the programs listed, the entire series that you see on your screen. Now the first tuba recital in Carnegie Hall was by Roger Bobo. And that was in 1961, just, just to note that. So we've reached the end of our presentation today. If you are interested in more information, you can go to back issues of the journal. At the beginning, it's a TUBA newsletter, and then it became the TUBA journal, then the ITEA journal. From about volume 14 to today, and right now we're in volume 47 or 48, depending on what the number is coming out next. They're all in the members area of the website. The issues before that, they will be posted at some point. You can check the ITEA online website, and you can also check social media. Check Facebook, Instagram, and also Twitter. If you are interested in what I am doing as a historian and what we are working on for 2023, which is the 50th anniversary, it's coming up. My personal website is drobnackbrass.com. Look for the Research tab, and then look for the ITEA History tab. It's a lot of information there. And it's more of an assembly point to figure out what we're going to do. Would you like to help? If so, contact me. There are some things I need, I need assistance with and would really help me out. So thank you for watching my presentation. Please attend the next presentation, which I believe is scheduled to be the general membership meeting.